Well, thank you so much. And um, thank you for inviting me. I don't think I've ever spoken in uh, Iowa before, but uh, I'm slowly filling in my list of uh, places I've been and people I've talked to. So thank you very much. Let me share my screen now. Oh, you have to make me a co-host. So I can share my screen. Let's try. So how's your weather out there? You got any snow yet? <laughs> uh, it won't be long for us. We got to get through this storm. We got a storm coming in now. Um, tonight and tomorrow, we're going to get two to three inches of rain. And I'm supposed to move bees on uh, Monday morning. Uh, my mating nukes have to go to the wintering yards and uh, and if it's too wet, I'm not going to be able to do it. I don't want to get stuck. <laughs> so we're all uh, we're all hoping that it's not going to be too much. Rain. Uh, yeah. All right. Try that now, Mike. Go ahead and try that now and see yeah, if that works. I'm there we now. go. Oh, yeah, we got in there. Very good. Okay. So let's see. I've got that. Yeah, I got that. Very good. So um, yeah, again, thank you for inviting me. Um today I'm gonna talk about brood factories and um and their importance in my operation. And and I hope by the end of the uh, <clears throat> my presentation that you realize how important they are and how much they uh, they lend towards a sustainable apiary. You know, without my brood factories, I do believe I'd be I'd be out of business. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So let me um, continue here. So what is a brood factory? Well, let's see. A brood factory is let's see if I can get this out of here. There. Um, excuse me. Okay, there. What is a brood factory? Well, a brood factory is any beehive that um, its whole purpose in existence is to make you frames of brood um, for your apiary to be used wherever it needed in your apiary. Uh, can any style of beehive be a brood factory? Yes, of course. Um, obviously, if you had Langstroth frames, you'd want a brood factory that had Langstroth frames. I mean, but so if you have warres or or top bar hives or or whatever, you just want to uh, use the same style frame that you use in the rest of your apiary. So it's really not um, it's not uh, you know uh, it doesn't matter what kind of hive you have, you know. As long as you use uh, the same frames that you use in the rest. <clears throat> now, this is nothing new, you know. Buck, uh, brother Columban at Buckfast Abbey. So, Brother Columban was uh, was Brother Adam's mentor, <clears throat> and he made uh, he made uh, Brother Adam his uh, helper in the uh, apiaries, and then Brother Adam, of course, went on to run the run the show. But in 1900. Brother Columban devised a, a beehive that held four nucleus colonies. And in the, in the springtime or the early summer, he would use the excess brood produced by those nucleus colonies to boost his honey production colonies, to bring the population in his honey production colonies to a peak uh, at, at the proper time so they'd make a honey crop nothing nothing di different there that's that is a brood factory although it wasn't ever called a brood factory before what what they're called now in the catalogs and most people refer to to these nucleus colonies i i raised as resource hives okay true they have the resources to rebuild your apiary to fix to fix uh struggling colonies to re queen failing queens or to or to re reestablish uh weak colonies but 
from everything I've I've seen, um, YouTube's and whatever, and in the catalogs, uh, resource hives are pretty much considered a one-to-one -one option, meaning that if you have a colony in your apiary and that's failing in some way, you have these this colony in your apiary, this nucleus colony that you can give to the failing colony and resuscitate it, rebuild it, whatever it needs. But it's a one-to-one -one thing. One resource hive saves one production colony. Well, to me, brood factories are way more than that, and I'll, I'll tell you why I think that. <clears throat> A number of years ago, I came up with this slide to show how my sustainable apiary um, supports itself. So each corner of the, uh, of the triangle is a different part of my operation. So at the top are the honey production colonies and they're supported by nucleus colonies. So if I have a, a failure, a winter loss or whatever, I have nucleus colonies to re restock, rebuild, you know, dead outs and weak colonies. The production colonies give breeding stock to the mating nuclei, to the cell builders and to the mating nuclei. And the mating nuclei give queens to making the nucleus colonies. And all three parts support each other. So if I had a loss in my production colonies, I have nucleus colonies to rebuild them. Um, if I have a loss in my mating nucleus colonies, I have bees in the production colonies and bees in the nucleus colonies to reestablish my mating nuclei. So they all, they all, it, each corner of that triangle supports the other two tri uh, corners of the triangle. Well, then I realized that, well, wait a minute, something is missing in this slide. And what's missing is brood factories. Brood factories support everything, everything. Brood factories can give brood to production colonies to boost the population to take advantage of the honey flows, as did Brother Columban. Brood factories um, give emerging brood to strong colonies and then are, and then are turned into uh, cell building colonies. <clears throat> the nucleus colonies we grow, um, all the brood and bees for and honey for the nucleus colonies that we start midsummer every year. Uh, all comes from brood factories. So we don't have to uh, split <clears throat> or depopulate production colonies to make nucleus colonies. We have a whole side of the operation called brood factories, and they give us all the brood and bees we may need to make nucleus colonies. They give us all the brood and bees that we need to build wicked strong cell building colonies. And they give us brood and bees to boost production colonies when we find them lagging. So this is what brood factories do for my operation. Now, you may wonder why <clears throat> I keep them in, um, in nucleus colony size uh, boxes. This is the difference between horizontal configuration and vertical configuration. In horizontal configuration, let's see where my next slide is. In horizontal configuration, um, you're trying to, I'm trying to grow brood. And so to expand the brood nest sideways, the bees need to warm those combs and polish those combs that are out at the edges of the brood nest. But they can't do that until they have population. And they can't, and they can't have population until they expand the brood nest. So it's sort of a hang up right there. It's sort of a catch 22 thing. That they can't that they can't expand horizontally until they have the bees, but they don't have the bees until they have extra brood brood combs. Well, in vertical configuration, these boxes are only four four comb uh, cavities, <clears throat> and everything is vertical. And so there aren't there's really no there's no need to go horizontally. Everything is vertical, and heat rises. 
And so the bees can easily uh, populate empty combs put into the put in above the above the brood nest or within the brood nest, and the queen goes right to them. And, and there is no lag time because of that need to expand horizontally. So the reason I have in nuke boxes, and remember, I have uh, the bottom layer of my brood factories, of my nuke boxes, is a double with a divider. So there are two nucleus colonies in the bottom box with the divider, uh, an entrance on opposite sides or ends, <clears throat> and then four frame nuke, nuke supers above them, sometimes four or five, sometimes even six stories high. But in that footprint of a 10 frame Langstroth, which is what I use, I have two queens laying. I've got one bottom and one cover, but two queens laying in that same footprint, which I think is a better plan. And ease of handling, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to lift off heavy supers or whatever in order to find some brood to put in to use where I need it. So, you know, the heaviest box you'll ever pick off off of these uh, off of these nucleus colonies is tw is twenty five pounds, and usually a little less, maybe twenty pounds, which pretty much anybody can can handle. And what do we use them for? Well, we use them for boosting weak colonies, as I said, or strengthening cell builders, or starting nucleus colonies. This is a this is a, a strong double nuke box in May. The thing is exploding in population. And this is what I'm looking for for the starts of my cell, my uh, brood factories. So boosting weak or slow colonies. Weak is not the good, uh, not a good word. Uh, I shouldn't use weak because there's lots of reasons that a colony could be weak and I wouldn't want to help it out anyway. You know, it's got disease, it's got parasites, it's, uh, you know, it's not even worth boosting it anymore. But slow, yes, maybe. Slow colony would be better. Um, slow colonies can, other than disease and high mite loads, maybe it's, uh, um, maybe it's the queen. Maybe it's the way they wintered or whatever. So they just need some population. So we boost them with brood harvested from brood factories. You know, if you take a slow colony, it's only got four or five frames of brood when the good ones have eight, 10, 12 frames of brood. And you harvest a, a box of brood and put it on the bottom board below this slow colony. And you come back in a week or 10 days or two weeks, you know what the population is going to be of that colony. It's going to be exploding like somebody dropped a bomb on it. Now, just doing that alone isn't going to, isn't the full job. There's other things to do. The colony probably should be requeened. There's a reason that it was that it was slow coming out of the winter poorly or or whatever. So uh, along with boosting the colony, once it's once its population is boosted, then you can go through and requeen it, which should be done. So you imagine if you put uh, six or seven or eight combs of brood like that on the bottom board below a slow colony. My goodness, you're going to have a monster in a very short time, a, a honey produ producer in a very short time. And where does that brood come from? It comes from brood factories. It comes from frames of emerging brood. You can see this is a beautiful frame of uh, just starting to emerge. This is that kind of, this is the kind of comb of brood that when you put it in a colony or a cell builder or whatever, it explodes and it immediately boosts the nurse bee population, which is exactly what these colonies need for strengthening cell builders. <clears throat> so we, we grow some pretty enormous cell builders. And we start with something like the, the hive on the left, the bottom three boxes. There's two deeps and a medium. That is my standard brood chamber here in the north of uh, Vermont. I need that much room for for population growth and for storing, you know, 60 or 80 pounds of honey while they're still growing population or to give them a little extra room in the springtime. Uh, so swarming isn't so, so soon. 
you know, so then they're, they're not swarming on the dandelion flow, which sometimes can be enormous. It gives me a little bit more time to get those first supers on. Then about uh, the end of April, beginning of May, we put on two medium supers. And then on May 9th, or whichever day we start our cell building, we separate those two supers uh, with a queen excluder, making sure there's no queen in that in that top super. So you shake all the bees out and on the ground in front of the hive, put it back over the queen excluder. Now you know you don't have a queen. And on top of that super goes a box uh, with two combs of, of honey. You know, there's a comb on the outside wall of each side and seven frames of emerging brood. I'm saying emerging brood. Not, not purple eye brood, not recently capped brood. It has to be emerging brood. Now, I used to use any brood I could find when I first started using this method. This is Brother Adam's method of cell building. And you can read about it in Beekeeping at Buckfast Abbey. But, um, um, but so when I was in England and I and I got to meet and have dinner with a with a, um with a beekeeper that worked for Adam for 10 years, he said, no, it has to be emerging brood. Why? Because I'm trying to build the nurse bee population. We're going to put this brood above the excluder and in 10 days graft into it. Well, in 10 days, a lot of that brood will have emerged and be a proper nurse bee age. And so we're building the nurse bee population. <clears throat> 10 days after that there's no more larvae in the uh in that in the combs that we put up there because they've been a, above a queen excluder for 10 days we separate the colony we put we put the queen right parent colony on the ground facing backwards and we start a new a new bottom board and the medium and the deep are on top we shake the bees out of the queen right up you know the core of the brood nest where the worker where the nurses are into the cell builder and because the cell builder is facing the original direction they get the field bees so they have this huge colony of nurse bees and field bees and you make them queenless and they're hopelessly queenless because there's no more larvae in there they can't raise a queen and in two hours you graft into that and it's just they take onto those cells oh my goodness well so we're trying to raise quality queen cells. Well, how do you increase the quality of the queen cells? By increasing the amount of jelly fed to the larvae and the pupae. It's all about the jelly. Quality of the queen cells is all about the jelly. And, and you, how do you maximize the amount of jelly? By maximizing the number of nurse bees in the unit. And when you do that, this is the kind of queen cells you get. Enormous queen cells full of jelly, I believe these are day six queen cells after grafting. So they're four days from uh, from going in the mating nukes. But it's just saying, look at that, look at the size of the things. So how do you maximize the amount of royal jelly? By increasing the population of nurse bees. And how do you and how do you do that? By in, by adding frames of nurse uh, emerging brood. And where does that brood come again? From brood factories again so all the all the help that went to the production hives brood factories all the brood that went into building nurse be, uh, cell building colonies brood factories well what about starting nucleus colonies what about starting whole apiaries like this i mean are you still splitting your your honey production colonies well if you split your honey production colonies and then the weather changes and they don't make a honey crop or you've depopulated them enough so they have to rebuild themselves in order to make a honey crop and they can't because the weather is terrible or whatever or the flow ended before they got rebuilt you don't make a honey crop so where does the brood come from making nucleus colonies of course from brood factories so I got started making uh, brood factories a while ago. I think uh, 2011 was probably the first year that I could, I had something I could actually call a brood factory. 
and I need a brood for starting cell builders and creating nucleus colonies because I raise all the queens that go in the nucleus colony. So I needed a lot of resources to, uh, to you know, have this operation going. And where do I get the brood that, that's needed for that? Well, this is pre-brood factory times. So as I said pre in previous produ uh, productions, I would sacrifice the non-productive colonies, colonies that are, aren't making a honey crop when others are, colonies that are making one super of honey while the others are making three, four, five supers of honey. It's slow, it's lagging behind. It didn't respond to manipulation or whatever, but it's got brood and bees and, and resources and, and a queen. So sacrifice that colony. Totally get rid of it. Get rid of the old queen because, you know, something wrong there. You blame the queen. Get rid of her. And you use all the combs of brood and bees to make nucleus colonies. And that was great. And then I could leave my honey production colonies to be honey production colonies. But once I really got started making nucleus colonies and queen bees, I didn't have enough non-productive colonies. So then I started splitting up productive colonies, production colonies. So I harvested brew from production colonies. So here's a nice apiary of production colonies that, that, I'm, that I want to harvest brood from to make nucleus colonies. So for instance, you know, these are all mediums on top. They're probably full. Let's see. It's, you know, it's, it's getting later in the summer. It's probably, probably mid-summer right here. And it's time for me to start my nuke. So I'm going to take off four supers of honey and pull out a little bit of brood out of this box, two frames, whatever I can take in a frame of honey to start a nuke and put the honey back on. Nah, I was great when I was 35. <laughs> I ain't 35 anymore. I can't do that anymore. I can't do that kind of work. It just seemed like a waste of time. And I'm depopulating my production colonies. Well, what about sacrificing overwintered nuclei? So when you overwinter nucleus colonies like this, you always got some really nice ones, real strong. They can go in a 10 frame box or they can, you can sell them. They're really nice bees. But what about the other side? Sometimes they're just not very good. So you let them build up, give them more combs, you let them build up, and then you sacrifice them later in the, in the summer when you're making nucleus colonies. But that didn't always work so great. Because there's a reason that that colony is, is weak, isn't growing well. And back in these days, it was when I was having problems with chalk brood. And so a lot of these colonies would just be stinky rotten with chalk brood. You can't use chalk brood colonies to make nucleus colonies. So they'd be out of production. And, and probably they usually fail by the end of the summer. Well, then I could sacrifice the strong ones like this one. So those things that those colonies are going to make me brood. And I should be able to t uh, harvest bees and brood from these with no problems at all, with no chalk brood and they're, and they're nice bees. So I started with strong overwintered nuclei in about in, in May. Dandelions are blooming. There are some dandelions in the back. Um, the grass is growing. haven't cut it yet. And so in 2011, I, I, I kept 50 overwintered nukes. Um, and from May 9th to June 19th, I harvested 245 frames of brood and I stocked 35 cell builders. And then shortly after that, or at the end of my uh, cell building, um, I started making nucleus colonies with the brood that was left in, the, in those 50. And I made 330 nucleus colonies to overwinter, which is pretty amazing. You know, 900 and something frames of brood from 50 nucleus colonies. <clears throat> I will say I never, I never uh, reached that number again. Um, and I'll tell you why. But the reason I was able to get that that much was because the nucleus colonies were completely sacrificed. So at the end of my time of building uh, the, the nucleus colonies, there was nothing left. I used everything. And I kind of thought that was wasteful. So the following year, I, I followed a more conservative plan. And rather than 
rather than sacrificing the nucleus colonies, I just took what I could from the nucleus colonies, maintaining their, their strength and allowing them to winter over. So yes, I made lots of nucleus colonies and lots of queen cells and lots of queens, but I still had my nucleus colonies that I could overwinter. So the brood factories became perennial, which is the difference. This is the reason why I'm not able to get as much brood out of each one, but it doesn't matter because I have plenty. So anyway, I'm gonna have a, uh, I'm gonna have some, some slides now that show us the the uh, the progression of of brood within the um, within the the nucleus colonies, and each each comb of of a different thing is a different color. You know, honey, emerging brood, cap brood, etc. Mixed brood would be eggs, larvae, and some capped. And this is a typical nucleus colony after it's made. It's got a frame of honey, a frame of mixed brood open brood, a frame of capped brood and an empty comb, and enough bees to cover the brood and honey. The reason you use mixed brood is because it holds the bees. Capped brood doesn't hold bees well, so when you make these, uh, these nucleus colonies and you move them somewhere or even leave them in the yard, um, they'll drift. They'll drift to somewhere that they like better, and so mixed, mixed brood will hold them, open brood will hold them. So this is a typical double story, double nuke box after it came out of winter. And you can see they vary a little bit with from the number of frames of brood they have, how much honey they have, if they have any empty combs at all. But this is typical. They're not all the same. They're all individuals and they're gonna be a little different. So then we wanna add a third story to these because we're trying to maintain them as brood factories and we don't want them to swarm. You can't keep these things in two, in two stories high with eight combs. So you have, to, you have to give them more combs. So you're on, a, you're on a flow now, maybe dandelion. And if you were to put another box of, of combs on top for a four empty comb, brood combs on top, and you're on a flow, most likely they're gonna put a lot of nectar up there but I'm trying to get brood. So the, met, the, 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 the middle box is gonna get two empty combs. Now the two empty combs aren't gonna go in the middle of the middle box. They're going to go against the divider. This gray stripe in the middle is the divider between the two nucleus colonies. These two, nu these two combs are actually the center of the brood nest the center of the active brood rearing cluster. And the, the actual center between the two nucleus colonies is the divider. And so that's where you put at least two of your empty combs in order to build them into a third super. super. And the other two might go on the outside of the top box, along with some of the brood. So now you've got empty combs with brood below it and brood next to it and brood above it and the queen is gonna go right there and fill those two combs real fast with, with brood. So I'm gonna eliminate one of those because it's getting a little too confusing. So let's just work with one side. So this is the, the two-story strong uh, nucleus colony that we added a third story to. And we start to build them up. It's gonna be brood factory. So there, there's a lot of them are three stories. Some of them are four stories. So now we're going to harvest brood from the cell for cell builders. Now this starts for me. This starts May 9th every year, and you know, frames of, of emerging and honey. That's what goes in uh, cell builders. So this is the the nuke that we just added the empty combs, and they're going to build up. We take a three story colony uh, nuke, and we start pulling brood from it. And usually the top boxes have quite a lot of nectar and not so much brood, but never say never. Usually the middle box is the one where these two or these three are, are well populated with brood and maybe down below um, these two combs here. So we're looking through basically looking through these uh, eight combs to find emerging brood and maybe a honey. Well, the honey would be up here. So here's a honey up here. So I take that out. And here's a nice uh, emerging brood here but the other ones are, are eggs 
or or brood that's in purple eye or white eye and that's not good that's not old enough oh but there's another one right here another another emerging so now i've got two frames of emerging in a comb of honey the one next to it is also exploding in, in population so we we harvest that similarly <clears throat> kate and tucker looking for looking to make sure it's emerging brood looking for the queen Making sure there's no queen, you don't want to pull the queen out of the brood factory and give it to the cell builder because then you don't have a cell builder. So this is typical emerging brood. Um, sometimes there's more. There's just a little little bit that's emerging, or it's just starting to emerge. So after adding column is on the left. That's that the slide we already had. Harvesting emerging brood. Well. If you look at the two combs of mixed brood in the top in the middle box, you see, if I come back to those in, in 10 days, say, 10 days, two weeks, the mixed brood will be capped and it will be starting to emerge. And so there's the emerging brood here and here. <clears throat> and we're taking, so we're taking a frame of honey and two frames of emerging brood from this brood factory this time around. We'll be back in two weeks to take more, but this is what they're going to give me now as far as emerging brood goes. And we replace those combs with empty comb. So here we took a honey and an emerging and an emerging and we replaced them with empty comb. If we were to add foundation, it's pretty much the same thing as it was before. Here's a three-story nuke, nuke, brood factory nuke that we wanna add a fourth story to. And we want to get some foundation drawn out they're right in the prime flow right now. And they're, and they're drawing, able to draw foundation. So you give them foundation. You put the fourth box on. But again, you don't put all the foundation up on the top. You put two uh, combs of uh, frames of foundation in the sweet spot and two frames up in the top on the outside. And what's going to happen? They'll draw the, uh, the ones in the sweet spot. They'll draw it out and fill it with, with brood. And the ones up on top, they'll draw it out and put nectar up there, which is exactly what I would expect. At the same time, we, hey, we came upon two more frames of emerging and maybe a frame of honey. And we, we harvested those and replaced them with empty combs and so forth and so on. So now the nucleus colonies, the brood factors are getting real strong. Why? We're pulling brood out all the time. Yeah, but we're only pulling out emerging brood in May and um and so you know we get to a coma brood and it's purple eye and we can't take it well when we get back to that colony in two weeks it's emerged and it's mixed brood so we can't take it then again so they're constantly building population even though we're pulling brood so what we what the object is is to pull enough brood out of these brood factories so they won't swarm but not so much so that they dwindle so we get around about every two weeks and we'll pull out a frame or two, whatever they can give. But if they're starting queen cells, swarm cells, you have to go through the entire nuke, ridding it of queen cells, and then pull enough brood out so that you can create a big space right in the middle, right in the middle here, right in the middle here of empty comb. So you might pull out three combs of brood and put in three empty combs right in here. And that gives a, a queen, a place for the queen to lay immediately. And it pretty much slows them down or stops that, that swarming. Once we have queens uh, caught, or if we start the cell builders on the 9th of May, the first queen catches the 13th of June. So there's quite a delay. But once we have queens ready to go, then we can start making nucleus colonies. So if the first queen catches the 13th of June, we start making nucleus colonies on day uh, uh, 14, 15. Um, on the 14th or 15th. Um, we're catching queens every four days from the 9th on, from the, excuse me, the 13th on. We're setting up cell builders every four days from the 9th on. So then we can make nucleus colonies about every four days. So here we are, we're going to make four nucleus colonies from the brood factories. And the brood and the nucleus colonies need a honey, a mixed brood, a cap brood, and an empty comb, as I showed you before. Okay, so here is 
one, two, three, four. Here's a five story uh, brood factory. We need four combs of honey. Boom, there's four combs of honey on the top box. Um, we need, uh, uh, you know, mixed brood, cap brood, and an empty comb. Well, there's not often at this time of year, uh, this time of the season, empty combs. So they come out of storage most likely. But look at there's plenty of uh, of cap brood and and mixed brood in in this. So we get maybe maybe uh, we only get uh, two frames, or maybe it's three frames. So we put we put a mixed and a capped in the first, and maybe we get another cap. We put that in the second, and we mix the bees up. It doesn't matter. We go down the go to the next brood factory, pull out what you can there. That, there's another, another honey we can take. Well, that goes in the nuke box over here. So we, we're making 50 or 60 a day. So, and, <clears throat> and as you pull out the uh, frames of brood and honey, you replace them with empty comb and you let them build up again. And so they're always building up. Even though we're taking it away, we're, they're building up all the time. We make whole apiaries of nucleus colonies, 50, 60, sometimes 70 nucleus colonies in one apiary. At some point, we need to do some requeening. So it's usually in July when we're done making nucleus colonies. We're pretty much done grafting. All we have to do now is, um, you know, catch queens. Any, any brood factories that have queens that are two years or older, are, are suspect. I need uh, these brood factories to have really prolific queens in the spring to make me as much brood as possible. I can't take the chance that you know that that, that third year uh, they're gonna they're gonna start to fail, and now I'm not getting any brood out of them. Well, we use push-in cages to requeen with. So the colony to be requeened, you you find a frame of emerging brood and nectar, and you brush the bees off. And you locate the queen under the cage with no bees in, in there. But the emerging bees emerge and they, they've never seen a queen. So they immediately accept her and she starts to lay. So now she's being turned into, she's, when you get queens in the mail or even me, I put them on my, on my table overnight and in the morning they're shrunk up. They're no longer big but butted queens. They're shr they're shrunk. Their pheromone uh, pattern has changed. Their attitude has changed. So they're not laying, even though they're mated. They're not laying. So I need to get that queen into lay, so she'll be accepted more easily. And so you leave her in there for four days. The nurse bees that uh that the young bees that hatch out become nurse bees. They clean her. She starts to lay in those combs. Now she's a laying queen again. Now I can remove the, the cage after four days. And look, within a minute, two minutes, they've already formed that retina. They've already, they've already accepted that queen. And it works. I, I swear it works damn close to, excuse me, it's hard close to, to um, 100%. It really works well. Anytime you replace an old queen and, and want to requeen with a new queen, you all really ought to consider using a push-in cage. After new, making nucleus colonies, so we're done making nucleus colonies about July 10th. You see, we only, we only have a, a month from the middle of uh, June to the middle of July to get all these nucleus colonies made. We have such a short season here. So in that time period, we're making uh, somewhere up near 350 nucleus colonies. And because we're taking the queens right from the, right from the nukes, from the mating nukes only a day or two before and using them to introduce into the nucleus colonies, we have amazing um, acceptance. Um, these queens must be good stinky queens because you know, over the years we don't, we've, I don't think I've ever lost more than five queens that didn't get accepted in any one year with 330, 350. You know, in the last few years, I mean, it's been four. I think I had some fours and a five. So it's pretty incredible. 
But anyway, so after we're done making nucleus colonies, they sort of look like the slide on the left. And we give them some foundation because goldenrod is coming on and they're going to need more room. And I always need more comb drawn. So we put some foundation in to give them some room. But after the goldenrod flow, excuse me, after the, uh, you know, and when we we're done uh, pulling brood for making nucleus colonies, we try to take them all the way down until they only have three, maybe four frames of brood left. They got a big population. They're going to repopulate real fast. But if you leave them too strong and they go through that goldenrod flow, a lot of them will swarm. So we get them down to three or four. So let's see what this one's got. One, two, three, four, four frames of brood. <clears throat> And they'll build their population and they'll, and they'll go into winter. So then after the golden rod flow, they look like the uh, slide on the right. You know, they got they got eight combs of two boxes of honey on top. And then the bottom, the, in the brood nest part, they've got, you know, one, two, three, four frames of brood still. They got a little more honey than they had before. And so I like to winter them in three. And I want them the top box of the three full of honey the next one down almost full of honey, and the next one down with a little bit maybe on the outsides and some empty comb space here for clustering. That's what I'm looking for. So I can take the top box off and, uh, and evaluate, you know, it's after goldenrod, so there's not much more coming in, evaluate the overall weight of the, of the colony. And so the top box, you pick off the top box and you look at it, it's full. You can tell when it's full, you can look at it from underneath, you can see it's nice puffed out with honey. Okay, put that to the side. Pick up the next one. That one should be almost full too. And you pick it up and you weigh it. And, well, it's just not quite as heavy as the other one. How much syrup will that take to fill it up? And you write that number down. And then you look at the bottom one. And yeah, maybe you want to put some in for the bottom too. But with two, two boxes full of feed, full of capped feed, that's probably enough. So I'm saying it's going to take probably two gallons of syrup to, to completely fill this box. So we feed them two gallons of syrup. Same slide, sorry. Then once we get them, uh, you know, get the honey off and get ready to feed, we have to do something about varroa mites. Nucleus colonies are special, you know, nucleus colonies, um, there's something about them that they that they can out outbreed varroa mites. <clears throat> now you have to start with from a brood source that has a low varroa uh, load already. But it seems like, and this happened during tracheal mites too, and it was so obvious that the that the colony, the nucleus colonies, can outbreed the varroa mites, and the varroa mites can't overwhelm them. Now, I'm not saying in the second year that that's true, but at the first year, it really is. And also, remember, the brood factories were, were removing frames of brood from them all the time. Well, where are the mites in the high, in those brood factories? In the brood. And where are the, where are the mites going? In the cell builders, in the nucleus colonies. So in the cell builders, we're really putting a lot of brood in those from, you know, three rounds or more. And so... Those need to be treated usually, whereas the, the brood factories themselves, not really so much of a rush. So with the brood factories, we started using uh, oxalic drizzle. I think we're having some pretty good luck with it. Um, it seems to hold the population down so they don't, they aren't exploding in the springtime. And then in, uh, and in May, in early, early May, we started we started using the uh, oxalic glycerin pads, and I'm really impressed with how the oxalic glycerin pads work. In most cases, in many cases, I I saw I marked colonies that had a high varroa load in in May in the drone brood, treated with pads, left the pads on in July. We looked again, no parasitic mite syndrome, beautiful combs of pearly white brood. So for these colonies, it worked very well. But for the other, some of the other colonies, it didn't seem to work at all. So it's a, it's a work, it's a, you know, it's something, a work in progress. Um, we need to figure out why and uh, maybe adjust things a little bit. But 
I'm pretty excited about it. Try and being able to get away from some of the miticides we've had to use over the years is really um, exciting for me. So then we have to feed them for winter. And so this is my typical record keeping. Um, we start off in uh, March 22nd of 2001. That's what the number 3221 means. In March, I'm not opening them up to, and pulling frames out to see what's going on. I'm just looking to see, do they have food? Do they have population? Can I see any brood down in there? They're always usually in the top box, but if not, but they look okay, I write okay. Then a month later, the one on the nuke on the left has eight frames of bees and the nuke on the right has four. Well, they're obviously lagging behind now. You go to the 13th of May and the one on the left has five, eight frames of brood. We take one away, they have a green dot queen. The one on the right has five frames of brood which isn't bad, but it's not like the good ones. And so somebody has written requeen. And, you know, we follow them through, give them another box, pulling out frames of brood, four frames of brood. So the one on the right started to rebuild itself. <clears throat> we had to take some brood away because they were getting too strong and so forth. And we pull out, we pull out enough brood until we get it down to that position where there's three or four frames of brood left in the middle of July. And well, since somebody said twice, requeen this one, we requeened it. We killed the queen. We gave it a daughter of breeder queen 84 and she was mated in 21. And then we go through and we, we pick up the top boxes and we pick up the middle boxes on the brood factories. How much syrup do we need to make sure that those two boxes are heavy? And, the, and this year we had it in, 2021, we had a bit of a drought up in the north end. And so a lot, of, a lot of the nukes needed three gallons of syrup, which is rare for here. You know, it's usually one or two, none are one or two with an occasional three. It seemed like everything up north needed three last summer. That's pretty much how we uh, keep records. And then anything important gets written down someplace. So we feed with paint cans, gallon paint cans with four or five, six penny nail holes punch through the lid in the near the center of the lid and we put shims down three eighths shims and we put the cans on top of the if they need uh, if they need multiples you can you can put two on at once with them they meet over the feed hole the bees will go up suck that syrup down and gosh in a week it's gone something like this and you need a shell around it to protect it from the weather and make sure there's no no cracks to protect the uh, the syrup and the bees from robbers. You don't want to get robbing going. And eventually we have to wrap. So yes, I wrap my bees in the, in the, for the winter. You may not have to do that. You probably don't have to do that. Also, there's another few things, you know, there's been a real debate about upper entrances. I have upper entrances on all my hives, including my nucleus colonies. So if you go to the second box from the left and you can see up near the top on the on the right hand nuke there's a there's an auger hole it's a three quarter inch auger hole. The entrances for these nucleus colonies are way down on the bottom board. So it's way down here under the snow. We may have snow on these uh, up against that entrance for for the rest of the winter, this is probably December, we could have it, we could have them buried in snow until April. <laughs> No way for the bees to ever take a cleansing flight. But with that auger hole above the snow line, if it gets to be uh, warm enough for the bees to cleanse, <coughs> excuse me, they will have a cleansing flight. Also, we built up a huge amount of moisture in these uh, in in our beehives in the in the winter time, and there needs to be some release release of that water vapor. I'm I'm criticized a lot about having these upper entrances and about water vapor, especially from across the pond, you know, but if I don't have that, <clears throat> that upper entrance, my bees are dripping wet on the inside. <clears throat> but with an upper entrance, a lot of that excess water vapor vents away. You come out in the in a cold morning after a cold night and you look at these upper entrances and there's a horizontal icicle sticking out of the hole that shows you how much moisture is leaving these hives. <clears throat> 
So here's the uh, one of the brood factory yards, fully wrapped. This is in the same as same yard as the cell building yard. So right over here to the left are all the cell builders. So it's great to just take brood from the factories and put them in the cell builders. <laughs> so this is it. Pretty much it's tar paper, cut to fit, stapled on, nice and tight. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not a uh, it's not an insulation factor. It's a solar gain factor. The paper is black. On a cold winter day, which are usually here, or the, those days are usually clear, the paper gets very warm and helps heat up the inside of the hive just a little bit. So if the bees need to bring in some nectar, some honey from the outside of the cluster, from the edges of the cluster, they can bring it in. The top of the inner covers are, are insulated with a two inch foam, inch and a half or two inch foam to prevent condensation under the inner covers. And here's the upper entrance. Paper is uh, stapled against the upper entrance so that the bees won't get stuck behind it. Covers are tied down because covers have a way of blowing off even with stones on them. And if they blow off, uh, the, the colony is dead. They won't blow off with a tied down like this. And so here, just a minute or a couple of minutes after I wrapped this hive, look, at they're already coming out. And you can see what kind of day it was. It was cold out day. But here it is, the, the, the paper's already warming them up. They're already peeking out to see what's going on. So what is it we're doing with all these bees? We start in the springtime. We start adding combs. We start building them up. We harvest some brood for cell builders, replacing the brood with empty comb, and we let them build up and build up from two, from three stories to maybe five stories, giving them more room all the time so the queen won't won't uh, swarm. And then we start making nucleus colonies. And the first round of nukes, we might replace the comb, but eventually we start knocking them down, knocking them down, taking everything we can except for those three or four frames of brood, getting them from five or six, sometimes super high, down to three by creating nucleus colonies. And then at the end, we let them build up. So we've created perennial brood factories. They don't get sacrificed like in 2011. We're just trying to give what the bees give us. We're just trying to take what the bees give us. We're not trying to take more than they can give us. We work with the bees. And all that I've been talking about, do you see the difference between a resource hive and a brood factory? All this cannot come from a single use resource hive. It all comes from brood factories. All of it. Every year when I lose a bunch of bees in the in the winter or even now, this time of year, we're losing lots of bees from varroa mites. But I'm I'm feeling pretty good because they got 300 nucleus colonies out there wintering that this year are just exp, exp, beautiful, very populous, boiling over with bees going into winter. And I know I'll have the replacements to replace. I might lose 30 to 50 percent of my bees this winter because of varroa mites, but I have the replacement bees. I don't have to buy bees from anywhere. I don't have to split up my honey production colonies. I've got the bees wintering right in my apiaries ready for use. So anyway, that's what brood factories are for me. Thank you so much. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. Are you going to talk to them or what? Oh.
Okay. Any questions? Good question. Will you be able to make those slides available to us after the fact? I, but have you recorded it? Yes, but I don't have to share it if you don't want it to be that oh, way. Oh, you go right ahead and share it. That's what I'm okay. here for. Okay. Okay. So yes, we can. Absolutely. But how about you send us an email so we know that you want it? Sure. Okay. Just don't. You know what? Don't sell it. <laughs> That's all I care about. It don't. You'd be surprised. I don't even know how I would collect you money would to be do surprised. that. You would be surprised. <laughs> okay. Other questions? What about those butterflies behind you? People are oh. wondering. Oh, well, the, um, my brother used to work for Motorola and he got shipped to uh, Malaysia a lot. So he always come home with these butterfly plaques. They're, they're pretty awesome. So there's some nice ones there. Yeah. You know, there's some, there's some pretty good ones there from Malaysia. Blue ones and, oh my gosh. I always like to sit when I do my talks, I like to sit in this chair because then I get lots of questions about my butterflies. <laughs> yep, go ahead. What percentage of your operation is brood factories versus honey production? Um, so until recently- In winter, I, sorry. Yeah, for what I need. Um, so I'm going down in my numbers of product, production colonies, but um, I usually usually had around 600 production colonies, and then we make around uh, 350 nucleus colonies, and a lot of cell builders. Um, we got uh, 20 cell builders, but we use them three times each, so that's seven. That's 21 frames of brood each, and then um, in the nucleus colonies. And we have, I don't know, 500 and something mating nukes. So the brood factories have to support all of that. And so I have around 100 or 120 brood factories, and that's plenty for me. Um, I, I would start slowly and, and until you know how to manage them, <clears throat> you know, have, a, have, have two or four or, or something for a two for a 10 frame operation a 10 colony operation or something like that until until you're familiar with how to run them and then you'll see where you can use them and how many more you need and <clears throat> you didn't see it but some people's eyes when you said that went and some people are like yeah but it was really funny to see when you said the numbers out there yeah right and We'll take one last question and then we will honor your time, Michael. Where is he in Vermont? Where are you in Vermont? I am in the northwest corner, about 12 miles from the Canada border. And I got bees all along the border. Um, some of my best, uh, some of my best uh, apiaries, they, pr they produce, uh, well, they have to know how to speak French. You know, and so they, they make a like, be surprised how much honey I get from across the border. <laughs> but yeah, that's about right. What? Okay, one last question. What is your major source of honey plants? Gosh, you know, we have so many that starting in, um, starting with maple, I mean, I've seen them make uh, honey from maple trees in, uh, in April, but then we have the dandelion fruit bloom, which this year produced two supers. And then we have honeysuckle and sumac and the, and the plants around that time, uh, mid June or, you know, late May of mid June, which was a failure this year because it got cool and sprinkly and crummy weather and they didn't make anything from traditionally good ones. And then we get into the to the clovers and uh, and then we get into basswood and basswood is an awesome, awesome honey plant if it yields. So, you know, that's one of our best ones, um, especially in late summer. I've seen them go from empty supers to full supers on the basswood. So and then we have a goldenrod aster after the basswood is done. 
and then it's finished. We're we're done. Um, har uh, nectar's done coming in by beginning of October. Um, pollen goes a little later. Uh, uh, um, aster pollen goes quite late, but no nectar. So, so those are our honey plants, basically. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, there is one more question, but it'll keep cost going. you. Okay, you keep going. <laughs> Do they have what? Do the bees have passports to get into Canada? Well, <clears throat> no, but they kind of skirt the border station, you know, and they don't have COVID documents either, but, you know. Very good. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up here. You take care. Thanks again, Mr. Palmer, for joining us here. And we're going to so, sign off from if the Somebody ICPA. has questions and they're not sure. Well, you go ahead and write me an email. Okay. Got that? Write him an email. If you need help with writing an email, let me know. Then I can put it in the buzz and you can all know. So, Very all good. right. Thanks so much. Take care. Take care.